fight. And another, another foul on Ward. His third for setting a screen. Because of physical play, although George Taylor just got caught with a moving screen. Kick and roll. And a foul. Offensive foul coming up dead. Battle box get it right there. See? Hello, everyone. Hey, shut up. <laughs> this is how we're starting this one. We're not editing it. <laughs> Start it over. No, you guys get the behind the scenes. This is how we go. Welcome back, everybody, to another edition of the Moving Screen Podcast. I'm Brendan Quinn of The Athletic, here with Dylan Burkhart, UM Hoops. It is late in the day on Thursday. Michigan uh, is coming off a loss to Illinois, but has a big game against Oregon. Do you say Oregon or Oregon? I say Oregon, but I'm just a silly Midwesterner. I don't know how you're supposed to say it. This is true. I, well, I'm not I'm going to claim my accent is good for anything, so uh, we'll go with Oregon. Um, this is just going to be a little mini pod here. We just w- want to preview this game. We think it's a pretty big matchup. Uh, we both had time to do it, so we just kind of wanted to look into this game. We'll obviously touch a little bit on the loss to Illinois as we go along. Um, we're not really going to get into Michigan State, Oakland. Um, this is just going to kind of focus on this Michigan, Oregon matchup. We just wanted to put something out there for the people because we love you. Um, make sure you subscribe to the UM Hoops and to the Athletic. Uh, that's what keeps us doing this stuff. So, um, Dylan, you're like the expert of experts per usual because you've seen the Ducks in person on an island. Yes, and I actually wrote 75% of a preview on the odd chance that Michigan might have had to play Oregon in the Bahamas. Nice. So I have studied a little bit of Oregon film this year, so ready to dive in. It should be a top 10 matchup, right? I'm Obviously, Michigan lost, but both top 10 teams yeah. at Chrysler. Yeah. It's about as good as it gets for non-conference. A little noon action. Yeah, 9 a.m. Pacific time. It's a tough, Very convenient. tough hang for Very the Ducks. Very convenient. Um, I don't know how that got done, but I'm a big fan of the new tip off. So I feel like that's an old beeline staple. I can remember them at West Virginia and beat UCLA in a noon game back in the day. I feel like that does sound right. Uh, they had Arizona here for a noon game, still lost. <laughs> they so, did. There's some shade, but <laughs> okay. Uh, let's look first and foremost. At the Ken Palm projection of this game, Michigan's now down to 17 in Ken Palm, by the way. Um, that projection is a 70 to 67 Michigan win. I'm already going back and forth on this one. We'll get into pr- uh, predictions at the end of this thing, but you have a good, you have a decent, you certainly a better grasp uh, on Oregon than I do. So let's get into the matchup starting on that side of things and go from there. What, is, what jumps out? So let's start with defense because I think that's what makes Oregon a really interesting team. Um, I don't know if you remember when they played in the NCAA tournament, but Dana Altman runs this kind of 2-3 matchup zone that basically he starts out in a little bit of three-quarter court pressure, drops into a 2-3 zone, and then about halfway through the defensive or the offensive possession, he'll switch to man-to-man essentially, or it seems like man-to-man. Mm-hmm. So... With a short shot clock, it's really hard to adjust. Do you run man offense? Do you run zone offense? How do you get good shots? So it's it's tough to – you don't see it all the time, right? You don't see – no one in the Big Ten is running anything really like this. So Mm -hmm. it's a hard prep. Uh, Oregon's on a longer – or, yeah, longer prep. They have the whole week off. Michigan's coming off this Illinois game. So that's probably where it starts, and that – Oregon's defense has not been particularly great this year. They're ranked 52nd in Ken Palm, but that's still a really tough look to prepare for that you have to really, it's kind of, I think it's hard to simulate until you see it in a game uh, and figure out what you want to do to attack it. Um, but that's where I start when I look at Oregon. Yeah. And in terms of common opponents, obviously they were both in uh, the battle for Atlantis. Uh, Gonzaga scored a point per possession on the Ducks, North Carolina scored 1.2 points possession um, on the Ducks. So it's, I think Memphis put up 74, Houston put up 66, Seton Hall put up 69. Um, so yeah, it's a it's a complicated defense. 
but also Oregon is it it's a really good defense when Dana Altman has a older experienced team that has played in it that the personnel knows each other they understand what they're doing think of it as kind of the Bayheim zone the matchup zone when you get pieces that all know what they're doing it's a stranglehold but when you don't it can really break down really easily um, this version of Oregon is kind of slipshod pieces put together. There's off, there's, there's transfers, there's a freshman playing key minutes. Um, there's a this lot team, going on with this roster. This roster is kind of like if you were going to start like a semi-pro league and just needed to get dudes from wherever you could. Uh, they basically lost the entire roster other than Peyton Pritchard. That's an exaggeration, but... They recruited basically everywhere you can. They got the number one JUCO. They have mm-hmm. a reclassification. They have a grad transfer, mm-hmm. a waiver transfer, all these guys. Uh, guys so from it's Mexico, a, guys from UNLV. Yep. They just – and they got some good guys, right? I mean – Oh, they're they dudes. Used, they are going to be a lot better team in March, I think is pretty clear. Yeah. So you want to play them when Michigan is playing them right now. Uh, but there is – still a lot of room to grow into that system. So without a doubt. Right. So point being, you know, it's yes, you know what you're getting, but it's also the tenth game for this Oregon team. And right now they're ranked fifty second nationally in adjusted defense. Um so at the same time, Michigan against zone how would you how would you kind of characterize what you've seen against Michigan's um, spurts against his own. And I, I remember Jawan Howard kind of he, he gave an interesting reaction the other day when he was asked about the zone offense. And he said, yeah, we're seeing more of it. You know, he kind of seemed a little surprised, a little taken aback. Um, yeah, I mean, I I don't think they – I think they've been pretty good against zone. Mm-hmm. I don't think – I do think it's probably different to prepare for all these different defenses than – the mindset he's been in before this year, right? No one's running this bullshit matchup zone in the NBA. <laughs> I mean, that's just not what you're dealing with. That's a good uh, point. So well said. Sure, too. So, some of that is like, okay, <laughs> this is what we got here, right? Uh, but I don't think Michigan's been bad. I think they've had. A, I mean, Iowa played a lot of zone and they picked that apart. But again, that's Iowa. Uh, I, I think this is more like. You think back, I think it was the first, the Appalachian State game when they went zone late in the game and Michigan kind of stumbled. But other than that, I think it's been fairly efficient, effective, direct. I mean, I don't think Mich- I don't think Michigan should be terrified to see a zone defense mm-hmm. considering how well Michigan is shooting it from three this year. It's fair. Do you, do you feel more skeptical of their zone offense? Um, uh, some of it has to do with personnel, too. You know, um, if it's just kind of a, a haphazard zone, you know, and any zone you can score over. But, um, you know, if you get guys with a lot of length and things like that and it's an extended zone, um, that can maybe make – it's really all how comfortable or uncomfortable is Xavier Simpson, right? That's really what any zone defense you throw at Michigan boils down to. Yeah, and this – zone leaves you in the situation where do you try to ball screen it or not the fact that it's sort of like man-to-man means that i think you have to try to do that and try to make plays against it but that can be tough because they'll get in the gaps stuff like that it's different reads and angles and everything you're accustomed to going against a traditional man defense right so the big weakness on oregon's defensive side of the ball has been defensive rebounding uh they're ranked 317th in defensive rebounding, not which good. is not good at all. And Shakur Houston, who's their grad transfer from UNLV, he is one of their better defensive rebounders, and he is out tomorrow. So that is yet another issue. And I guess the fact that he's one of their better rebounders and is a 6'7 grad transfer also kind of speaks to the lack of depth inside right now. Yeah, um, you know, it's interesting when you, uh, to kind of talk about rebounding and Michigan right now because of what just happened. Um, you know, they just played one of the best rebounding teams in the country. 
and the the best the best offensively. I don't, mm-hmm. I, I don't know what their defensive numbers are, but they're obviously very good. But def- offensively, Illinois is ranked number one uh, in offensive rebound percentage. So, because I don't think of Michigan as being a bad or a poor rebounding team, um, they Starting can be to. they can be better. And but last night was disconcerting. Isaiah Livers had one rebound in 37 minutes. Yeah, I used this stat in my story today. Isaiah Livers is ranked, I think, 71st out of 90 qualified Big Ten players in defensive rebounding rate. Uh, the only thing more surprising was that Aaron Henry was below him on that list, but uh, that is not good. His defensive rebounding rate is almost cut in half from last year. I don't know if it's because he's trying to leak out in transition or what, but that's an issue. Yeah. And when you have Franz Wagner and Isaiah Livers out there at the three and the four, Neither of those guys are really grabbing defensive rebounds. That's an issue. And Oregon is terrible on the defensive glass, but they're really good on the offensive glass. Uh, I wonder if some of Michigan's defensive rebounding issues come from the fact that they've faced teams that are really post-up heavy these last two games. Mm -hmm. Uh, Different kind of rebounds, right? Uh, Shorter, Teske's more, I guess, occupied. Right, so John Teske can't grab the rebound because he's defending the post up. Uh, Oregon's not going to post the ball up like that against Michigan. Uh, going to be more jump shots, drive stuff like that, which could actually maybe help Teske kind of contain. I don't know. I don't. I don't know how to put my finger on why Michigan's been so bad in the defensive glass. Mm-hmm. But I start with Isaiah Livers, and then I look at well, they used to have Charles Matthews in that spot, and right. that's a downgrade, right? Right. Um. What did you make last night of – look, you know you're going to get outplayed down low by Illinois, right? What did you make of Michigan being utterly dominated um, within eight feet of the basket? How much well, of it's Illinois? How much of it's Michigan? I think that a lot of it comes down to the rebounding, right? You're giving up all those points in the paint because – second chances. If Michigan were getting clean rebounds, the shooting numbers would have been pretty drastically different, right? Because I think Illinois had seven putbacks. Mm -hmm. Those are free baskets. Uh, I think the bigger issue is probably... Yeah, I just think it comes down to the rebounding. I don't know. There are probably too many drives given up to the rim, but you're just talking about Coburn one-on-one against Teske? I mean, everything. It looked like men yeah. against it looked like men against boys on both sides of the floor. Offense, defense didn't matter. Um, you know, Teske obviously tried to hold his own, but Michigan got nothing out of the four spot, and the rebounding was just it was free money for Illinois. If anything, they should have been. Sh- I thought they should have been shooting more. <laughs> like they were running offense. I'm like, just shoot the ball, just go get rebounds, and just go for put. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like and any time they got into a half court set, I'm like, what are you running? Stop it. Just shoot the ball. That's basically Illinois' offense this year. Mm-hmm. So it's hard to weigh. Because if you think back to the Creighton game, Michigan was really bad on the defensive glass. Yeah. And yeah. Creighton doesn't do that. And you're like, holy shit, that's not a good sign. Yeah. Iowa and Illinois, they're two of the teams that are really going to test you in that department. So I don't know. I don't know what to make of it. Uh, could just be playing on the road against. A really good front line. I think the problem is you did not exploit Georgie and Coburn on defense, right? Uh, Illinois could stash Georgie on Franz. He couldn't hit any of his open shots. Livers was guarded by a guard, couldn't get open shots. In the Bahamas, Livers was being guarded by a guy like Georgie and just roasting him, getting open threes, doing all that. Uh, you worry about that stuff a lot less if Livers didn't threes on the other end of the court. Yeah. Um, let's talk about the premier matchup of this game. Yeah? Or do you want to keep talking about No, let's do it. <laughs> okay. Um, Xavier Simpson, Peyton Pritchard, probably two of the five or ten best point guards in the country. Um, probably the best point guard in – I'm trying to think of Pac-12 – point guards is he the best point guard in the pac 12 i think he's at least one of the five best point guards in the country i think they both probably are there you go so Um, i think yes 
I mean, Oregon's Pac-12 favorite. Yeah, I mean, anyone that watched Oregon down the stretch last year, um, when they really, really got white hot, um, we kind of, we probably got to give a little love for Nico Mannion. He's pretty nice on Arizona. True, I'll give him credit. True. So one of the two best. But when um, I didn't really see too much of Oregon last year, but down the stretch. When they got hot, won the Pac-12 tournament, won a couple games in the NCAA tournament, um, had that classic game against uh, Virginia in the Sweet 16. I think that was when the country kind of really understood how good Peyton Pritchard is. He is a legit All-American caliber point guard, um, and is numbers-wise um, well on his way this year too. Almost 40% three-point shooting. Um, Assist rate ranks top fifty nationally, and uh, and they're winning some games. Four year starter mm-hmm. knocked Michigan out of the NCAA tournament as a freshman. Uh, that was what four, fifteen years ago, sixteen years ago. How long ago was that? Well, it feels like it. A dog gear uh, over here. <laughs> uh, he is one of the best ball screen point guards, uh, along with Xavier Simpson. So they're both just really good passing, scoring out of ball screens in a way that you don't see very often, right? They're both super efficient, high usage ball screen guards. Pritchard will do it with the off the dribble jump shot, though. Simpson is always trying to get to the rim. Pritchard's going to be a really hard guy to contain with drop coverage, I would say, because he can just step in and hit that elbow jumper pretty reliably. Uh, Be interesting to see how Michigan decides to guard him in that regard, but yeah, he's special. He's, I mean, Michigan's played some good point guards already this year. They've played Halliburton. They've played Cole Anthony. But Pritchard's right up in there in that group, I would say, without a doubt. Yeah, I mean, the one of the fascinating things about this is you look at Xavier Simpson, and I feel like the more field goal attempts, the better chance that you have to win. Peyton Pritchard's probably the opposite, right? I I found it very interesting, Brad Underwood's comments last night, because very few coaches actually just say what we all think, right? And he came right out and said, you know, we... What was the exact... Let me make sure I get this right. I don't want to misquote the guy. Um, do you know what I'm talking about? Vaguely. To be fair, he said something similar last year. I mean... I, yeah, go ahead. There you go. We feared his passing more than we did his scoring, right? And it's just, that's an obvious line, and the numbers spell it out. But, like, I, not many people just say that. But if, you know, Xavier Simpson took 14 shots last night. That's too many shots. And it's, some of it is what was there. Um, But... You know, they. I felt like they did a really good job of creating those two-on-two matchups where everything else was kind of eliminated out of the court. And it ended up just being Xavier Simpson just trying to create for himself. And there were a lot of just wild, bad shots that were low percentage at the end of the day. Thoughts? Yeah, so I wrote about this. Uh, I have not today. read your and, content yet. I'm sorry. Yeah, and I, I was watched the, I was all the car the for 100 screen. hours. <laughs> I watched all the ball screen possessions from... Last night, I guess it is. Uh, I actually thought Michigan got some pretty good looks. Like, the Louisville game, you go back and watch the ball screen possessions, there was nothing. It was a lot of desperation, dribbling, whatever. Michigan, I feel like if you went back and pulled the 20 successful plays, that's exactly what they wanted to do. Uh, When things didn't go wrong or right, Every three, they missed off a ball screen. Uh, the problem is those were coming to Brandon Johns, coming to Franz Wagner. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that is not great. Uh, I Simpson was shooting 71% at the rim before that game. Mm-hmm. Uh, he did not convert well in that game, but I can't. you can't tell me those are bad shots. I feel like they were the shots that Illinois wanted him to be taking. Yes. Any you ball know what screen— I, like- they you were can, putting him into spots where he would be taking the hook or be trying to finish with one of these monsters coming from behind to get the the recovery block. It was exactly what 
Illinois wanted him to be taking. Yeah, so Illinois' ball screen defense was basically exactly what Michigan tries to do. Mm -hmm. And when Michigan shut down Gonzaga, we talked probably, I don't know if we talked about this in the podcast, but how Teske was able to guard two players at the same time, right? He's able to show on the dribbler and take away the role. And Kofi Coburn did an amazing job at that last night with his size. Mm -hmm. That's not an easy thing to do. No. Uh, It's a really hard thing to do. And Simpson still had eight assists. And I think you'd probably go back and watch all of his shots around the basket and think he makes more than he made on most occasions. Uh, So I don't know that it's like the script is out. Whereas, because Illinois literally didn't help off of any of the perimeter players in the ball screen game. Uh, it's hard to, if, if someone's going to do that, yeah, it is going to be a two man game. Mm-hmm. And so, yes, you succeeded in making them do what you want to do. I don't know if that's going to work every time though. That's fair. That's fair. But I mean, this whole conversation started with the fact of like, what's the right amount of, sh- that's such a weird question, but like, you know, what should Xavier Simpson's offense look like? Cause we know what Peyton Pritchard's offense is going to look like in this game, right? He's going to take. I don't I think I'm just talking about this depends on how you're covered. Right. It depends. Like when you run a lot of ball screens, you have to give something up so you can choose what to give up defensively when you're defending that kind of team. Mm -hmm. So if Xavier Simpson takes a lot of shots, it's not necessarily because of Xavier Simpson. It's because of what the other team chooses to give up or not give up. I think he can force the issue sometimes. No. So what is I think in the second half in the second half? There was a lot of talking going on. I think Xavier Simpson got a little ahead of his skis in that game. I don't know. I don't think he didn't finish well. I. You want to he say talking. he got? Yeah, of course he was talking. It was a different level of. I'm just saying. I think he got out of his game a little bit and was looking for his offense a little bit too much. It's not like we haven't seen this before. There were the games. Last year, where like I understand, yes, if you're if the de- if the ball screen defense is going to allow you to take that shot, that doesn't mean you have to take that shot. What else? How else is Michigan supposed to score? If, so, like, if there's the philosophy of the only option that we have to score is what the offense gives us, that's that's not how it works. You can still create. You can find a way to get the looks that you want. You don't only take what the defense gives you. Okay, I just look back. I think Michigan would run those same ball screen plays, mostly the same way, and probably finish better if they ran that game back. Oh, I think they would. I think they would try to change things pretty dramatically. I'm not sure how or what or why or how, but I don't think that they would just go take a do over of what they did. Certainly not on defense. I think no, that, I'm, talk, I'm only talking back offense. the game. I think there's more to worry about Michigan's defense than offense. Okay. That's, I mean, yeah, do Teske and Simpson had to win the game. They didn't win the game. That's what it comes down to. Mm-hmm. I don't know what you're going to do. Maybe a few more ISO plays for Isaiah Livers, but does that really going to – are you really confident if you're going to say that's what we're going to do instead? He had well, two really good takes on the baseline, but still – I feel like you they there could have been a level of uh, uh an extra, an added level of patience in the offense um that in, instead of taking the shot that was there of looking for something else that might have been available. I thought the issue was forced and as the shot blocking um kind of mounted that they got very uncomfortable and were affected. Definitely, he was definitely affected by the rim protection. Um, I think once you get a couple of those shots blocked, it messes with your confidence, and then he missed a couple that he should have made. I think that's for sure an accurate statement. I just don't think that there's going to be games where Simpson takes 10 shots, and the games you make them, he makes them, you're going to say, oh, that was a, it's almost like forgettable, right? Like, how many shots did he take against Iowa? I mean, I have to go back and look at his shots, but I feel like the ones that he missed weren't not like great clean looks. 
But what was the look? That's like there wasn't another look that Michigan could have got at that. But it's not like he was I'm, freelancing. I mean, Jesus Christ, they're not playing Illinois is good on defense. They're not just absolute lockdown, shut down Virginia defense. Like uh, there are other looks available other than Xavier seeing a gap and going and driving and getting shots up and getting pinned against the backboard. Okay. He had some really good passes. He did adjust where he would draw in the shot blocker and make the wraparound pass to Teske. He did. It worked really well late. I mean, he still finished with eight assists. And I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to make this sound like I'm just shitting on Xavier. I mean, I'm just – that – that game is not. I don't. I don't think like that's Michigan's game. It's just it, that's my point. But well, give me All your right. thoughts on on Peyton Pritchard and what you think uh, Michigan should expect and how you think uh, Xavier will fare defensively on him. So I think what's interesting for Michigan is how you guard him in the ball screen, right? Because Michigan's plan in the ball screen has been this kind of lock and chase and go around the screen and drop the big in the middle of the paint, mm-hmm. right? I I don't know if that's the best way you would guard Pritchard, but I also don't know if Oregon basically has a couple good shooters, but I don't know if they're – I don't know what the best way to choose to be beaten by them is. The other, the other thing is uh, they will run a lot of that kind of spread offense that – Illinois actually used to run a lot more of that Brad Underwood kind of made famous. So you also have to prepare for some of that at the same time. Mm. But Pritchard can hit shots really good in transition. I, Simpson's obviously a great defender, but I think it comes down to more whether Michigan makes changes in the ball screen game or not. Mm. Looking at his numbers, it's 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 pretty interesting. It's rarely it's rare that you see a dude his his numbers spike from thirty two percent as a three point shooter to thirty nine percent, but then fall from eighty three percent as a at a at the foul line to seventy one percent. That's really strange. But sample size. Um, He's a career what thirty seven percent three point shooter. Those all thirty seven percent seventy eight percent from the foul line. Um, he's played a million games. Uh, in his career. Um, so what are the, th- obviously Xavier versus Peyton will get all the headlines, but what are the kind of your, when have you rolled out your preview yet? No, not yet. It'll be out there tomorrow, but uh, okay. all right. I Wait. think you look at what I said. I'm waiting. <laughs> okay. You need to get your facts up on this game here, man. Uh, Oregon's defense give up a lot of three-point shots, right? They're like 304th in three-point volume allowed, mm-hmm. but 40th in accuracy. So teams don't make shots against them, but they take a lot. That's pretty common for a lot of zone teams. If you're Michigan, you're basically shooting 50% from three in wins and 30, 25, whatever it is, percent from three in losses. Got to make threes, and I think that's probably where it starts. What's your biggest concern for for Michigan here? I mean, at this point, you'd have to say defensive rebounding. Oregon's good on the offensive glass. Michigan's been bad on the offensive glass. Do you have any level of um, concern isn't the right word, but um, Isaiah Livers against Louisville, Isaiah Livers against Illinois. I don't know if it's a matter of tape. You know, I don't know if it's a matter of matchups. Um, you mentioned that he's gone from kind of seeing true fours to seeing more rangy type guys who can kind of stay with him. Um, what do you think about Isaiah Livers at this point? It'll be interesting to see how Oregon matches up with him. Uh, they'll usually start C.J. Walker at the four, who's a mm-hmm. six eight five star freshman, still kind of learning the game though. Probably not the most disciplined defender. I don't know that for sure, but it's hard when you're adjusting to playing college basketball, right? And then at the three, they have another 6'6 guy, Chris Duarte, who's the number one juco uh, in the country. So 
one of those guys will guard him. You'd think Walker might be a little better for Livers, right? As a less experienced guy, maybe you get a few transition looks, stuff like that. Mm. But you've also started to see teams kind of stash their worst defender on Franz Wagner. And until he hits shots, that's going to be an issue. Yeah. it's. I've been kind of just giving Franz a pass at this point until they get back to until they get those two guarantee games under their belt after this um i feel like it's uh, unfair yeah, it's not or whatever. It's nothing against him like, yeah, fair, yeah, like it's on it, the court i mean that's what's going on on the court right he needs to he just hasn't had a ch- I, I feel like he hasn't had a chance to like build any confidence or build any feel for what the hell's going on out there you know i mean every game that he's played in is just a freaking pressure cooker and he's the new big thing, so obviously teams are going to key on him. They know that, you know, if you can just eliminate that option too, that it's way easier to isolate Michigan's top two offensive weapons, obviously Xavier and Teske. Yeah, I think it's more that teams are helping off him at this point, hmm. right? Like he gives you that guy you can help off of. Livers is shooting 50% from three. Eli's shooting 48% from three. Franz is going to be the guy you help off of, and Illinois did that. Franz had four wide open threes, and none of them looked really close. See, I don't remember so, any of Franz's looks last night because I was staring at the head coach, but it kind of makes it hard. <laughs> so that is that's what it boils down to, right? So he's five for twenty three for the year, and he hit his first one, right? So he's and one for nine in the last two. What and. Is he a better shooter? Did you like how much better of a shooter? Do you, what what percentage does he end the year at? I mean, he played eighty some games last year and shot thirty nine percent. So he can shoot. All right? He's not a bad shooter. I mean, but Mo also had super inconsistent stretches where mm. he lost his confidence and couldn't shoot. So I I don't know if it's I don't know why that would be related, but it is something about. Maybe how their shot works or confidence or whatever. Like, he does seem frustrated at times. Yes. He looked confident when he started shooting in the Bahamas. And by the end of that three game stretch, he was not, he was passing up shots and did not look confident in his shot. He, he was, also broke his wrist. So, right. <laughs> <laughs> his shooting wrist. I mean, that yeah. plays a part. That's a good point. He's shooting 92% at the free throw line. Like, he's going to, I think it's just, takes time and i like you say it's a really hard stretch to just fly into the yeah deep end here and i thought it was interesting you know the, the illinois game last night I, I i'm watching juan and he keeps going to nunez you know kind of time and again and time and again and it's you almost for a while there with wagner it, it seemed like he was almost just kind of locked in at, you know, well into 30 minutes a game or something like that. Um, I don't know. He still played 27. I understand. I understand. But, he, but I'm saying, like, it almost seemed like for a while there, like, Juwan just kind of had this, like, unfiltered, I'm just, this is our best option. We're just going to let this guy go, right? Regardless of what he did, does. And last night, sitting where we sit at Illinois, right behind the bench, like, I, I detected a level of frustration in his play. There was a breaking point there, I'd say. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and he's not going to give you much on the defensive glass. He had lost his – he clearly lost his confidence. And I think that going with the Julius down – because really what they ended up doing was going with Dave down the stretch yeah. made a lot of sense. Yeah. Uh, I do think you have to keep going back to him though because I think for this team to be as good as it wants to be – down the line, it's with Franz Wagner. And I I don't think he's going to shoot 22% from three all year. But until he does, teams are going to guard Michigan differently, or until he doesn't. And that's, I think, part of the issue with Livers is he's getting smaller, better defenders that are focusing on making him score any other way than transition threes, catch-and-shoot threes, dunks at the rim. Yeah, and you could – it's one of those things, hey, you know, you could you could really make them pay for that if you take that small guy that they – that is on you and you go rip some offensive rebounds down or you go play over him. He has 
one offensive rebound in the last one, two, three, four, five, six, seven games while playing 34, 35, 34, 38, 32, 37 minutes. Like, I understand it's a matter of if you get sent to offensive rebound. I understand that, you know. But, like, Isaiah Livers is still a dude who can get above the rim and be active and I mean uh, uh, that's not his game though I know but I know part of it's where you're on the floor and things like that but it's also like okay if that's going to be the matchup that you're given though maybe there maybe there's a different kind of counter and it's getting outside your skin a little bit yeah like I've never Uh, bought that answer like that's not his game well it's like well go your game ain't working right now so go find a different way to play you know I mean, he just didn't get a lot of touches. And if you sell out to take one guy out of the game and not give him any jump shots, you can do it. This is like back when Nick Stauska was a freshman. And it was like, well, why isn't Nick Stauska getting any shots? Well, there's someone standing right next to him the whole damn game. (laughs) Right, right, right. So you should be able to create an advantage when you're playing four on four. Mm. Right? Like help defense is what makes defense effective. Yes. You agree with that? Yes. So if you're taking one person away and saying they can't help, you should be able to create advantages somewhere else. Um, so if Livers is getting that kind of treatment, but the thing is Livers, they just need him to get more shots because he's just so damn efficient. So mm-hmm. I think transition is a really big area where he's really, really good this year. And that's something teams can take away if they do a good job of it. I Even mean, I- his, one of his threes last night was in transition. I think it was yeah. the play Juwan referred to as like the best play of the game. Definitely. But Where did Julius turn it down stuff. and found him? Yeah, that's the kind of stuff that when this offense was clicking in the Bahamas, those they were getting transition threes all over the place. I mean, that's the thing. It's Even with the ball in his hands, he had that against App State. He had five turnovers, um, and it was kind of, oh, man. You know, it goes back to that summer conversation we were having of him with the ball in his hands, and he kind of struggles. But since then, he, I think he takes care of the ball. You know, I don't know. If it's a matter of if teams are going to defend him the way that they're doing, maybe show something else um, to to give him a better opportunity to get shots. Like if teams are doing what they're doing now and I'm giving you the clipboard, draw me up something that gives him the look you want. So if you want to get Isaiah Livers more looks, would you run him off a bunch of off ball screens or put him on the ball in ball screens? Well, it, for me, it depends on who's in front of him. Because um, if it's any kind of size, um, I think I would want him running off screens. Yeah, I think he's still better without the ball. The pro- like So at Louisville, Michigan put the ball in his hands over and over and over again, mm-hmm. and he did not play well. He... He got a lot of shots in that game. I don't have the box score up, but he was inefficient, right? This was the opposite where he was efficient. Yeah, so Livers was one of nine. He was at, at 0 for 5 on twos. Yeah, so he was trying to make plays yeah. getting downhill, and he struggled. At Illinois, he actually had two great ISO takes where he did score. Um, it's just so hard because he's not a create. He's not a natural creator, right? Like it's more natural to say, all right, Eli's going to be our secondary creator. And he was the guy who they were putting in ball screens and he actually played really well last night, hit a bunch of mid range yeah. shots. But that is, that's where I'm at with, I don't know what the best way to get livers more involved is. He's not going to take a six, six. He's not going to take the best defender on the other team and beat him off the dribble, yeah. right? That's not his game. Yeah. He's, he can take a four man off the dribble, mm. but so really, Liver's usage rate depends on how well the other team plays defense, right? Like how well they can actually lock in on him and not let him get clean looks. Yeah, I'll be curious to see uh, what Oregon does and and even early in Big Ten play, how teams kind of – what they throw at him. Um, because, you know, it was so interesting coming – in hindsight, coming out of Atlantis – with the amount that we talked about Teske and Simpson and Franz working the way in the lineup and doing this and doing that. You know, the reason they, one of the primary reasons they got out of Atlantis the way that they did 
was Livers going for 17 against Iowa State. Um, what was it? 12 against North Carolina uh, and 21 against Gonzaga, right? Just that consistent, legit scoring option that is not solely dependent on... I guess he, I mean, he is dependent it was. On, 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 on Xavier, but like just something, I guess I, the way I should word it is someone who can actually capitalize, 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 I don't think I had an, I had 90 minutes of sleep last night, man. I'm done. Ugh. Capital, capital, capitalize eyes, um, off of Xavier in the ball screen. Like that's what you need is someone who actually gets you the points off of what he's doing. And that is what livers did in Atlantis. And if you don't have that. You get the, just the two-man game between Simpson and Livers, or I'm sorry, Simpson and Teske, and a lot of teams can't stop that, but some teams can, right? So you could also say because Livers played that role so well in the Bahamas, mm-hmm. that's why you get the two-man game with Simpson and Teske, right? Those teams in the Bahamas were taking away Teske. They're taking away the role. They're tagging. Mm. And Simpson just destroyed them because that's the norm. Like th- these preseason tournaments are not the most extensive scout in the world, right? Sure. Teams are mostly going to play their way. It's not a conference game, mm. right? Brad Underwood's been thinking about Garden Xavier Simpson ball screens for four years. <laughs> he he <laughs> got right. picked apart by Xavier Simpson and John Teske last year. These this is a year round thing when you're dealing with a Big Ten game. It's a good point. Real good Roy point. Williams has also played against Xavier Simpson every year. But the point remains, like, these preps are not as intense, right? You're yeah. trying to be the best version of yourself in a preseason tournament. In a conference game, you're doing everything in the book to try to game plan and change and learning plays, right? Like, Georgie yelling on a play. So that's an adjustment. And the thing is, Michigan's going to adjust. So teams are going to try to guard ball screens like Illinois did, and then – Teske will have a big game where he has three pick and pop threes, and then teams will do something else. It's it's such a give and take. And mm-hmm. the key for Livers is to keep hitting the shots when he gets them, and teams are going to have to keep guarding him like that. Uh, but if you look back at all his makes in the Bahamas, I bet 75% were assisted by Simpson either out of a ball screen or in transition. Right. So that that's what makes Simpson so good, too. It's just like it's a give and take, right? Yeah. Are we into prediction time? Because I can't go much longer on this. You're struggling over there, man. Dude, it's a nine I, I, nine okay. Eastern time game. I write freaking 3,500 words. Then drive back. I, I was late for a home inspection. Oh, it's a whole ordeal over here. Big trouble. Big trouble. Uh, let's get your prediction then. Okay. I am going to take... Michigan by six. Oh, that's a very specific prediction there. Mm-hmm. I would take – I just think the spot sets up for Michigan in a way that the spot set up for Illinois this week. So I think Michigan needs to win this game at home. And I also think if Michigan wins this game, it's about as good of a November and December run than you could have really imagined. They oh, played the 10th toughest schedule already in college basketball. That's before and, this game. That's before this game. Right. Uh, that's pretty ludicrous. And yeah. if you lose this game, on the other hand, you're looking at good thing we won the battle for Atlantis because there's a few more chinks in our armor. That Shine is off. off. Shine is off, and then you got Michigan State right after the holiday. And Purdue. Yeah. Giddy Welcome up. to the Big Ten. Giddy up. Um, so wait, so yeah, it's a really you... pivotal game, I think, just in terms of What's your overall feeling going into the game. I'll take Michigan 67, Oregon 62. Five. Okay. Oh, wait. Is that right? 67, 62? Okay. Yeah. Um, I think it's a little uglier than people expect. Like a choppier game. Fair. Uh, I think Michigan is really going to uh, enjoy getting... Back home on those rims. <laughs> yeah. You know? Um, They've played really well at home this year. 
So when do I get my steak? Oh, yikes! Not great. We'll have to figure that one out. Yes, sir. We, we, we didn't even uh, make it. You're supposed to be the smart one on this podcast, brother. You can't be made of better like me. Uh, it's all right. Just trying to boost your ego up a little here. Is that right? Oh, well, that was very nice because I feel great. Good. <laughs> well, we will be back early next week. Um, I'm not sure what the format or what we'll talk about, but I'm sure we'll do something. Figure something out. Yeah. Um, so make sure you check out uh, all of Dylan's excellent um, pregame coverage on UM Hoops. Um, does it better than anyone else in terms of kind of breaking down a matchup before you um, settle in for the game on Saturday at noon. So check out his content. Um, make sure if you are not subscribed to UM Hoops that you do so. Over on The Athletic, I did a story on uh, you know, my kind of watching Juwan Howard over the course of a two-hour game from right behind the Michigan bench. You'll probably be familiar with that story from did the same thing with Beeline and Izzo and, um, you know, I did it again this year because people seem to enjoy the original idea. So uh, just decided to, <laughs> to, to roll that one out there one more time. Uh, but also have a story coming. I, I'm hoping tomorrow on uh, um, a recently agreed upon new series for Michigan uh, and on the scheduling side of things that I hope that story goes up tomorrow because there's a lot of interesting stuff in there. So um, that'll do it for this episode of the Movement Screen. Thank you so much for listening. Be sure to leave a review in the iTunes store and be sure to tip your bartenders and your servers.